Hey everybody, welcome back. We are continuing on with Heidegger's The Question Concerning Technology. We left off on page 313 and we're down at the bottom. And there Heidegger is going to introduce uh, the, the idea of causality. And he's going back to uh, Aristotle uh, for, the, for, the, for the concept of fourfold causality. Um, and this is this is this is the way by which, as far as we can tell, everything comes into being. Um, I'll go ahead. We'll go ahead and read it. This again. This is the bottom of three thirteen. He says, "For centuries, philosophy has taught that there are four causes: uh, the causa materialis, the material, the matter out of which, for example, a silver chalice is made; two, the causa formalis." the form, the shape into which the material enters, three, the cause of finalis, the end, for example, the sacrificial rite in relation to which the required chalice is determined as to its form and matter, and four, the cause of efficiens, which brings about the effect that it uh, is the finished actual chalice, in this instance, the silver spoon. Um, so that is, to put it in English, <laughs> Uh, the material cause, the formal cause, the final cause, um, and the efficient cause. And each of these speaks to one of the four sort of essential things, happenings, um, that are required for something that wasn't to be. And so the, the example that he's using is a silver chalice. Um, if you're familiar with uh, any, you know, um, I mean, Catholicism in particular, but any sort of, uh, you know, religious rite in which, um, you know, communion or something like communion is, is happening, then perhaps you'll have some idea of the significance of a, of a chalice. Um, because it's, and, and this is important because the chalice, it's not a cup, you know, it's not a, it's not a coffee mug. Um, it is not, it is not a... Uh, a, a, you know, a glass that you drink water out of, but it has a very sort of specific um, religious uh, function, and that plays into why that thing comes into being, and and so too like with everything, um, and so the uh, material cause for the silver chalice would be silver. That's the stuff out of which it is made. The uh, formal cause is the actual shape of the chalice. So we're going to take this. We're gonna take this silver, this stuff, and we're gonna we're gonna shape it into something, right? So that's that's the that's the formal cause. That's the form that it takes. And then the the final cause is you know, okay. What's the what's sort of the reason or the purpose for bringing this thing uh, into being? And in, in this case, the silver chalice is you know because it's part of um, the the Eucharist, part of communion, part of this religious uh, rite, you know. Um, in which we we use it as this sort of sacrificial uh, vessel, so that we so that we you know we can perform this right. Um, and then finally, the uh, efficient cause. That's the person that sort of brings all this uh, together. Um, in this case, it's the silversmith, the one who's able to work the silver into the shape to provide it to the people that are going to use it. Um, and you know, in some ways, it seems like common sense, but again, like many things, until someone thinks through it and, and, and sort of works it out, um, in, in this case, in an, in an elegant way, um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of things remain hidden from us uh, because we don't take the time to think through, to think through how they actually work. And so why is this important? Um, this is important because it relates to technology, because technology is something that is a, a result of causality in, in the sense of it was, here's, you know, we've got something, we've got this, this table, this computer, um, we've got this device, this tool, you know, whatever, whatever it is that we're talking about, and it came into being, right? And so what are the most basic, essential um, things, occurrences that, you know, need to happen for that, for that to come? You need the stuff, you need the shape, you need the, the reason, you need the, the one or the people to bring it uh, together. Right. Now, it's also important because Heidegger wants to rethink the term cause 
uh, and it's going to be different from the way that we normally talk about cause. You know, when we think about cause, we tend to think of it simply as I do this or this happens, and then this other thing happens because, right, because we did this particular thing or something else did something. And Heidegger thinks that that's not the most helpful way uh, to think about it. Um, if you look, uh, he's going to ask him on page 314, he's going to say, you know, what does cause really mean? And if you drop down to that bottom paragraph, he's going to say, causa, causus belongs to the verb cadere, to fall, and means that which brings it about that something turns out as a result in such, in such a way. And then if you look down further, you know, he's going to go back to the Greek term, aetion, aetion, um, which the Greeks used, and that this really has something to do with being indebted. That it's not simply a matter of like something happening, um, although that's that's part of it. You know, it's like it's like not it's not like consequential so much, but the emphasis is on again going back to the Greeks and their term for causality. Heidegger's arguing is that it he, he wants to play up the fact that it, it signified indebtedness, meaning what? Um, that things come into being and they owe their being to that which brought them into being, that they wouldn't be otherwise. The, the table wouldn't be a table if it weren't for the wood. It's indebted to the wood. Um, it's indebted to the shape of a table. It's indebted to the reason for a table. It's indebted to the carpenter who made the table. And so too with anything, right? And if you already want to, you know, jump ahead in your thinking to what, what ultimately this might mean, it might mean that perhaps Human beings need to um, understand causality in terms of indebtedness related to their own being. Um, that you know, we, we we made it into the world. Now, you know, were we crafted? You know, do you have a religious view of the world? Do you believe in aliens? <laughs> right? May not be the most you know helpful route to take this because it's 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 dealing more with the fact that here we are in this world um, of things that are sort of coming into being and either. Nature is the sort of cause of these things, or in a, in a sort of a different vein, human beings through their through their techniques and through their planning and through their efforts are bringing these things into being. Um, and we don't often think about the degree of responsibility or indebtedness that's a part of that equation of bringing things into being. And that's what Heidegger wants to get at. You know, this 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 essay, this work. The question concerning technology is a sort of foundational work in the philosophy of technology, in part because it's having people rethink. Um, it has had people rethink our relationship to technology to such a degree to which um, we don't have such a thoughtless attitude towards it, and we realize that there's a there's a, there's a there's a dynamic um, at play. There's a there's a relationship that is that is going on. And it's one in which we have not really tended to that relationship. We haven't, we haven't sort of viewed it um, with the most, we'll say, philosophic or phenomenological um, accuracy. Um, and certainly not ethically. And that, that's probably maybe even the, the bigger point. We, don't, we, don't, we haven't been very responsible. We haven't been very ethical um, in terms of our technological use. Um, so what he does is he works through the silver chalice on page uh, 315, and it's he sort of works through how each aspect of it, you know, allows it to sort of come into being. And what he ends up saying, and again, think about the table. You know, so you got the silver for the, for the chalice. You got the you got the silver. You got the shape of the chalice. You got the reason for the chalice. You got the the, the efficient cause, the the silversmith, right? Um, and so, so the the chalice owes its being. It, it owes it owes the fact that it is to those causes, right? And what he says here, um, this is the uh, bottom of that second paragraph on 315, he says the, the talos or the, the aim or the, you know, the, the, the goal, the end, is responsible for what as matter and what is aspect are together co-responsible for the sacrificial vessel. So that's bringing in that, that third cause, right? So the, the first two he deals with in the top paragraph, then he deals with the third in that second paragraph. And then in the next paragraph, he says, finally, there's a fourth participant in the responsibility for the finished sacrificial vessels lying before us ready for use, the silversmith, but not at all because he in working brings about the finished sacrificial chalice as if it were the effect of a making. The silversmith is not the, 
is not a causa efficient. Um, what I, what I want to get at, there's, there's some other things that I, I don't know to be most, you know, totally helpful to, to bring up. I'm trying to figure out this lighting situation. Um, but that what he's trying to get at is that there's a, a co-responsibility, there's co-indebtedness between all participants in this thing coming forward. Um, and, and that means the material. That means the form, that means the plan, the aim, the end. That means the, the person or persons responsible for bringing this all together. Um, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from that for now, but just you know, keep, keep that in mind that instead of thinking causality in terms of you do this and then this happens, right? It's just, it's just, it's just causality. It maybe it implies a level of um, embedded or maybe that it implies a responsibility and that playing up that, paying heed to that aspect of bringing things into being, um, you know, of, of actions taken um, might be more helpful in us having a more empathetic, a more um, a deeper, more profound relationship, you know, with the world and the world of things that we have created. So, um, Heidegger also wants to, you know, change the the way that we think about cause and somewhat somewhat reinterpret it. So instead of saying cause, if you look at the bottom of three sixteen and the top of page three seventeen, um, what he wants to do is he wants to say that that where we get this word from from the Greeks, what he's going back to to sort of get to the origin of it, that it's better to maybe use the, the verb to occasion. This is at the bottom of page 316. To occasion. Um, and the, he says this is a more inclusive meaning so that it now is the name for the essence of causality thought as the Greeks thought it. A common and narrower meaning of occasion in contrast is nothing more than a colliding and releasing it into the kind of secondary cause within the whole of causality. Um, and so what, what you have really when, when you want to think causality, the way that the way that he wants to view it is a sort of um, a play of occasions in which things are sort of, 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 of happening in such a way that we are going to um, produce a happening, right? And I know that might sound sort of you know vague or generic, but but Heidegger again, he's wanting to think about this as a phenomenon. What is the phenomenon of technology? What is the phenomenon of bringing things into existence? And if it's not simply like, you know, pushing a domino and then so that happens and then that happens and then that happens, but rather there's more fundamental things at work and at play there, that perhaps viewing them as a play of occasions um, at least moves us in the right direction and gets us thinking it, as Heidegger says here, in, in a Greek way. When he says in a Greek way, he means in a more original philosophical way, that there's, there's closer proximity to... Um, the origin of articulation of things philosophically, and that that provides us with insight about how to think about things today. And, you know, the further away we get from the origin, you know, the, the easier it is uh, to forget, or the harder it is to retrieve um, what it is that something perhaps really is or really you know really means. Um, which, of course, if you remember that that first video, um, this means. That you know, when we're asking the question of the meaning of being, um, this is a sort of retrieval of a Greek, of a Greek question. This is a this is a retrieval of an ancient idea, an ancient riddle, something like that. Um, okay, so if you go to the to three eighteen, as he wraps up this sort of first movement of the text. He says, this coming rests and moves freely within what we call revealing. The Greeks have the word aletheia uh, for revealing. I mean, I'll just stop there and say, you know, if you don't recall this term, you know, this, this, this term aletheia is usually translated as truth. This is the Greek word for truth. But what Heidegger here is doing is he's saying aletheia means revealing, right? This is, which for, for him um, is a more literal translation uh, of, of Aletheia. It is a, it's, a, it's an uncovering, it is a um, unforgetting, it is a, it is a revealing. And that, and that those, those action, you know, uh, 
know, those sort of movement related terms um, are better ways of thinking truth, Aletheia, right? This is a better way of thinking truth, revealing, uncovering, um, than our sort of static notion of truth, which we tend to think of as something that's merely correct. As he says in the next sentence, the Romans translate this with veritas, where we get our terms like verifiability and such. He says, we say truth and usually understand it as correctness of representation, right? So I come up with a formula or I write a sentence, I make this sort of statement, and the degree to which I can verify it, uh, you know, like I can represent something else, that that sort of fidelity um, of representation means that it's it's true and that it's it's correct. I can I can measure one against the other, and and for Heidegger that is just not what the truth is. That for Heidegger the truth is a revealing. It's a showing. It's it's something. It's something that's happening. And what we try to do is we we try to like we try to see what's happening, and oftentimes that means we have to sort of um, you know peel back. Um, deconstruct to get past our usual self-imposed limitations for seeing things for what they really are. And when we become obsessed with correctness, and that's the only thing that we understand, um, things that can be sort of verified, you know, we take a test and mark all the right answers, or, you know, we say the thing that we can measure against the other thing, that it becomes really difficult to see things for what they are because we're only sort of interested um, in the in the sort of mechanism of verification, we're only sort of interested in the in the appearance um, of quote truth and not perhaps truth itself. And this is this is really important because for Heidegger, as long as we keep seeing technology the same old way that we always have, um, we're never going to see the truth of technology. Okay, he goes on to say um, that technology is also a way of, 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 of seeing or experiencing aletheia. He says in the, the very middle of the page on 318, that technology is a way of revealing, um, that, it's a, that it's a way of truth. Now, what does that mean? I mean, for Heidegger, it, it means, this can mean a couple, a couple of things. One is that there's everything that's happening, there's a, there's a truth in that. Um, there is, it's showing us something. So, tech, so technology or techne, like anything else that's going on in the world, there's 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 sort of its own truth to that to that happening, right? So we would want to sort of philosophically or phenomenologically try to see what's really going on and understand it. But I think in another sense, he also means that not just in a sort of general way, just like there's other phenomena, there's something very specific to technology that technology is revealing. So not just like the phenomenon of you know, the landscape or the clouds or the way that the heavenly bodies move around or any sort of particular natural phenomena, but something very specific about technology as being the way in which human beings bring forth something, that there's a truth in that. Like, why do we make the things that we make? We make these things and not these things, and we make them this way, and we have these sort of hopes and aspirations and fears associated with these techniques and technologies and devices and instruments and systems and what really is going on there like obviously we can you know we have a popular idea of, of why we have a phone we have a popular idea of, of why we drive cars we have a popular idea of why we have this this or this um, but what really if we start to peel back all of the assumptions what then do we really have and, and I think that Heidegger is sort of meaning you know these two things at the same time you know just sort of there's the truth of just any sort of phenomenon, but then there's a sort of specific truth or revealing um, that, that technology provides. But, of course, only if we're looking for it. Uh, that, that we won't just sort of see it because uh, Heidegger says, yeah, technology is telling us something very specific. Um, that it's telling us something, um, you know, about ourselves. And we go, oh, okay, that sounds really cool. I'm going to do that. I'll just see that. That it's it, it takes it takes much more work than that to sort of overcome yourself. It takes much more work than that to overcome the old habits, to overcome the apathy, to overcome the degree to which we're obsessed with amusement or anything else, to really begin to think in a different way, 
a way that's not obsessed with correctness, a way that is not obsessed with the sort of you know immediate results, um, a way that's that's slow, it's meditative, um, and and has us having to ask those questions. Like if you go back to the you know the first page of the text, that you know we really sort of slowly start to build a way of thinking by asking questions, um, and then not and not and not determining the outcome before we even begin. Um, as though that's, you know, somehow going to get us any place, you know, genuine or real. Okay, so let's go, let's go to, well, I should mention this. Um, if you go to that next paragraph on page 318, um, looking at, at the last sentence, uh, last couple sentences, he says, um, Techne is the name not only for the activities and skills of the craftsman, but also for the arts of the mind and the fine arts. Techne belongs to bringing forth to poesis. It is something poetic. Now, this is going to be talked about even some more, but just to sort of touch on it now. Techne, which we associate with technology, techniques, the not only the way in which we bring things forward, but the things that we bring forward, um, that it's related to this other term, the term that we get poetry from, and that's poesis. And that poesis is the sense of bringing forth whatsoever, right? And so here he mentions uh, the arts of the mind, you know, uh, perhaps the disciplines of the mind, perhaps the ways that we construct thought, concepts, ideas, but also the fine arts, um, you know, painting, sculpture, right, art, that these things are in their um, very essence, they are, they are poetic, they bring forward, they create. There used to not be this, you know, concept or argument for a way to do something, and now we have it, right, the, the, the poetry of theory. Um, the, the creation to bring forth a theory. There used to not be this portrait or this statue or this film or this song, but we bring it forward, right? Um, and so what he's saying is, is that because techne, you know, it deals within the realm of bringing forward sp specific techniques and devices and tools and systems, that basically technology is is poetic in in this phenomenological sense, in this in this uh, most basic sense, um, and that and that we've forgotten the poetic nature of technology, and now we, we view it the ways that, that we view it, you know, thoughtlessly or merely instrumentally, um, and so we need to try to reclaim its poetic essence if we have a, a fighting chance of, of wondering at it again, of it becoming something that can, um, you know, disclose truth to us, and we learn about ourselves from it, because right now, I would I would argue, and I don't think I don't think it's a terribly difficult thing to argue that that we're probably further away from ourselves than we've ever been but with the amount of technological um, intrusion and, and enmeshment that we experience day to day. That we're probably less familiar with ourselves and fallen out of acquaintance with ourselves um, than we've ever been as a as a, as a species, um, and that. You know, can we overcome that? Can we can we once again sort of get back in tune with uh, with who we are and, and not do it in a way it's like let's burn all the technology down, but you know, let's it be what it is, but recognize that we can have a more thoughtful and intentional relationship to it. It can actually help us achieve things that are that are good for us. Um, and you know, that we could we could talk a little bit more about that, and, and perhaps we will before we get before we get to the end. Um, because it might also impact the types of technologies that we develop. It might change what we're willing to invest in, um, you know, literally invest in, but also in terms of our time and energies, uh, what, what, um, what devices, systems, platforms, et cetera, that, that we use. Okay, so let's go to... Let's go to page 320. And the second paragraph, he says, what is modern technology? In that, in that second paragraph, what is modern technology? And here's, here's an important distinction. 
on one hand, Heidegger is talking about technology as such, right? It, go, it all goes back to techno. But in another sense, Heidegger is going to set up uh, a distinction between technology as such, um, you know, sort of older um, types of technologies, and then modern technology. And, and Heidegger and Heidegger sees a difference. You know, um, older technologies are much more patient. They, 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 they have a specific function, they, they do something, but they, they aren't forcing and compelling nature the way that modern technology seems to do. Let me read a little bit more of this and then I'll, I'll try to unpack it. So it says, what is modern technology? It too is a revealing, so it shows truth as well. Um, he says, only when we allow our attention to rest on this fundamental, fundamental characteristic does that which is new in modern technology show itself to us. And yet, the revealing that holds sway throughout modern technology does not unfold into a bringing forth in the sense of poesis. The revealing that rules in modern technology, here's how it's different, he says, it's a challenging, which puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supply energy which can be extracted and stored as such. But does this not hold true for the old windmill as well? No, he writes. Its, its sails do indeed turn in the wind. They are left entirely to the wind's blowing. But the windmill does not unlock energy from the air currents in order to store it. So what's he getting at? Take the windmill. The windmill patiently just sits there, doesn't do anything, until the wind decides to blow. And when the wind, you know, gives of itself, notice how we're changing the language about how we describe these things, um, going back to the language of indebtedness and co-responsibility. And when the wind gives of itself to the windmill, then the windmill can, you know, do what it was designed to do, but it doesn't, it doesn't force the issue. It lets nature act in its own time, and so it has this poetic relationship with, with the earth, with the wind, right? Whereas today, if we only had access to energy when nature gave it to us, we would you know, we'd lose our minds. <laughs> we wouldn't know what to do. We so thoughtlessly walk into a room, flick a light switch, energy just magically shows up, we plug things into wall outlets, we hop onto networks, um, everything that we do is powered, right? The, 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 the pace of our life, the activities of our lives, our expectations, our, our, our happiness and our sadness is so tied to having energy on demand so thoughtlessly and extends into everything. It's not just energy. You know, go, if you go to the grocery store, they got everything you want. It doesn't matter what season it is. It doesn't like, you know, you want blueberries, you can have them year round, right? That doesn't matter when they actually grow. Um, that 24 hours a day, you can have food delivered to you, almost any time that you want. And we just go, man, that's really great. Like, isn't life grand? I love living in the 21st century. We never think about the price. We never think about the loss of equilibrium um, and that what that um, imbalance does, not only to the place that we live, right, but, but to ourselves, how this sort of affects us, you know. Um, as, 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 as thinking, feeling, you know, spiritual beings, as it were. Um, and that Heidegger sees that this is a real problem with modern technology, that, that it's showing us something too. It's showing us something too, right? Just like all other technology. But it may not be something that we're prepared to see. It's probably a cost that we're not yet uh, willing to pay. Um, maybe and maybe and, and maybe it would be one that we decided we didn't want to pay, right? Um, but as as of now, we just sort of exist in a world where we can access all the things we want to access, do all the things we want to do, and pretend like it's just all sort of showing up. And isn't it great? Um, and and this for Heidegger, without explicitly saying it, that the tone of of, of this work is um, this is this is not sustainable. And this is not beneficial to us. Um, and we should really rethink what it is uh, that we're doing here. Um, and we should really think about the activities. Again, the, the automatic activities. You know, every push of a button, every time we plug something in, every, everything is requiring energy of some sort. It's requiring resources of some sort. And not the type that we're freely given, right? Uh, that, 
that, that, that originate in some sort of gift into something that we go and and we take. We take we 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 go to the earth. We challenge it. We take from it what it isn't um, yielding in a, in a in a sort of free um, poetic, if you will, way. So think about that. Try to try to walk through the activities of your own life and what you see going on. And, you know, think think about this um, in terms of a sustainable phenomenon. So let's look at uh, let's just look at one more thing. He walks through this step by step, this process of modern technology um, in terms of in terms of the energy aspect of it. If you look at page three twenty one, at the very bottom. He says the revealing again. Think revealing in terms of like truth. What it what it's what it's showing, right? The aletheia, the, the 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 truth of it. The revealing that rules throughout modern technology has the character of a setting upon, in the sense of a challenging forth. Such and, and you want to make sure you mark this. This is I think this is important sort of unpacking that Heidegger is doing here. Top of page 322, such challenging happens in that the energy concealed in nature is unlocked and what is unlocked is transformed and what is transformed is stored up and what is stored up is in turn distributed and what is distributed is switched about ever anew. This, this process Heidegger describes, and this is again, think about, think about ore, right? Think about, you know, oil, think about like whatever it is that we're, that we're talking about, like whatever it is that we take and we use as some sort of you know, energy or fuel or whatever, right? He's sort of saying, Here, here's how this happens. And it sounds, sounds violent, it sounds dominating, right? And that, that's, that's, that's part of the analysis, that's part of the problem. And he, he talks about this in the next paragraph in terms of um, what, what he calls Bestand in, uh, in German. In this, it's translated as standing reserve. That, that what we have is the world itself and everyone in it, we're going to find out, being transformed through this step-by-step -step process into standing reserve, which means what? Being there on call, on demand, any time that it is decided it needs to be used by somebody, by something. That, and, and that we are caught in this just as much as every other aspect of, of, the, of the earth, right? Um, that's why we have human resources department, right? To manage us as resources. Not because they're interested in our humanity and our and our actual well-being over the course of our lives and what's going on in our in our inner 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 lives, um, but to manage us as resources. And so too with everything, um, it is being arranged and transformed and, and challenged and all those things that he said, so that eventually, what do you have? You have a world that's on demand, right? Any time, any place, for any reason. This is not being responsible. This is not living with any sense of awe or respect for what is. And our technologies, uh, our processes by which we help to create this world in the, in the form that it is, reveals this to us um, if we sort of have the courage and the honesty to admit it. And um, perhaps, perhaps we ought to get to work doing something different. I'll leave that um, there for now. Um, I'll come back and we'll try to get through the rest of this with one more. So until then, keep reading, keep thinking.